So good afternoon, everyone. It's such an incredible pleasure to welcome you to our seminar series, the start of a series in 2022. Last year, we had a strong list of uh, presenters uh, and in our seminars, and we're very grateful for those, and many of you joined us then. And uh, this year looks like it's going to be a packed and wonderful uh, seminar series. And so we are so excited to have all of you. And particularly today, uh, we have uh, Dr. Jimmy Mandima, who is the I-4 Vice President speaking to us. I will take an, a moment to introduce him uh, a little bit later in a couple of minutes. But just wanted to run through um, um, a few slides just to introduce our, our chapter. We are the Zimbabwe. Uh, Becky. We are the Zimbabwe um, chapter of the Society for Conservation Biology, and um, we've got a team that leads the the work. And I just want to introduce the team. I am Olisi Spanda and I lead the team as president of the chapter. We have Nobesutu, Diane, Rebecca, team, and uh, Marilyn, who are also part of our team and do various bits uh, to keep the uh, work that we're doing going. Nobesutu um, is, is our, our president, uh, vice president elect and uh, uh, team deputy, Diana treasurer and um, Rebecca secretary. And we have Ma Marilyn who is also an organizing um, secretary within our team. Um, we currently finalizing our strategy uh, to which many of you contributed um, and uh, we'll be sharing that as soon as it is ready. Um, we want to ask many of you to be a friend or a member of ZMSCB and register on the link that is there. Um, we have a website, zmscb.org, uh, to which you will find, uh, at which you will find that link. Uh, but it's important that um, you sign up so that we, uh, uh, we keep a list of the people that are interested, whether it's a friend or a member. Because Zim SCB is a chapter within the broader um, Society for Conservation Biology. We really encourage our members to join uh, the uh, global SCB. And so please do consider signing up to the global SCB um, and the link is, is provided there. We currently are working on several projects, um, a resource library, horizon scan, blog and the, the seminar series that we're doing. The blog has been quite interesting in that it brings a variety of stories and ideas uh, on Zimbabwean conservation and beyond that, uh, that would like to, to keep sharing with many of you. And so if you want to write a blog, we really encourage you, please get in touch with Tim um, and uh, we will make sure that that blog, that idea, is given um, uh, uh, more a uh, platform on our website. Um, if you're on other social media like Twitter and Facebook, please do look for Zim SCB and do uh, follow us, join us on there so that we can keep you updated on what we're doing and where things are going in terms of our chapter. So I have, um, the pleasure now to introduce our speaker for today, uh, who is Jimiel. For To many of us, Jimiel doesn't really require any introduction. He is a, a well-known uh, person in not just the Zimbabwean um, conservation circles, but beyond that, um, he has been raised and nurtured within the Zim uh, circles, but uh, has become a global player. He is the vice president of IFO, the global programs. And uh, through that, he 
is uh, responsible for managing, developing, um, and directing IFOS uh, conservation programs globally in Africa and beyond, which is a huge task. Uh, he has a very deep understanding of the field challenges, having spent uh, quite a long time working in the Zambezi and in Zimbabwe, in Southern Africa and Africa uh, as a whole. His, his service to conservation, I think, is, is, is uh, well known and well appreciated by many of us. But I just wanted to point out that uh, Jimiel is particularly one of those Zimbabweans that I think now sits at the top tier in an important organization. Um, and it's not just been IFO, but he's been uh, vice president as well for African uh, um, wildlife, um, as well as a foundation, uh, which is another top-notch organization as well in conservation, not just in Africa, but has a global voice now. So in that sense, he is he's an example of, you know, the, the how high many of us who are in conservation could go. And uh, I'm delighted that he is there as a voice, uh, particularly uh, now as we're talking about uh, how inclusive conservation spaces are. I think he's one of those that has been able to sit at the table and bring a voice um, for some of us. Um, he continues to maintain links um, in Africa, around the world. Uh, he's based in the US and uh, we are very delighted as a chapter to have him he has followed us, supported us. And I think um, for many of us that are young, uh, this, is, this is something we really treasure to have someone that um, has been there and is able to share their experience and support uh, what we're doing. So Jimiel, it's an incredible pleasure to have you speak on this important topic of connectivity conservation and elephant flagships. Um, that many of us have dealt with are thinking about. Um, but uh, we, we also delighted because we feel like you're one of us, you represent us and you are an incredible example. And so without further ado, I want to uh, give you the floor and um, just a reminder to everybody, if you may, please feel free as Gmail um, uh, shares to put your questions on the chat. And uh, at the end of Gmail's presentation, we'll have an interactive session where you can ask your questions and um, we will moderate that as we go on. So Gmail, um, over to you. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation to be part of uh, the seminar series and particularly to open our 2022 series. Thank you. Thank you, uh, MX. Uh, it's um, certainly for me a pleasure to be part of this discussion. Um, I feel like I'm back home because I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces. Some of my mentors are among the audience, which is great to see everybody still active. But let me just thank you again for your kind words. I think you, you really use a lot of superlatives about me, but I'll take them on, you know, when they come. Um, but I really am just one of you, and I feel so encouraged to see a lot of um, young professionals, you know, aching it in the front lines. Uh, MX and I have maintained our contact from, for years, and it's good to circle back and talk about this important issue. But quickly about IFO, I know it is a global institution that is known by many, but uh, just so you know, our real mission is to look at how we can foster animals and people to thrive together in the places we call home. And that's essentially the planet, the ecosystems which you share and the resources. Uh, and for that to happen, we certainly believe it is important for bold action and some fresh thinking to come. Uh, but they always say this, usually nothing new under the sun. So a lot of this stuff has been done or started a while back. So what I will provide today is essentially an overview of issues most of us are familiar with, but I think a good reminder because a few things have happened you know, over the, 
the generations and the times, and we are aware of it. That's why we are at a point where we say, do we have enough space? What are the planetary boundaries? You know, how do we share resources? So it's kind of a wishy-washy title, but I did throw in climate there because we know it is the big one. And we do need to think, what does it mean for wildlife, for people, and for our economic development aspirations? So because I already said there's nothing new under the sun, we are aware of the ecosystem-based approaches from years back. And we science then already noted that um, if you confine wildlife, especially some of the megafauna, they don't do well. And fast forward, the whole transboundary natural resource management areas initiatives we started running. And I mean, we have some of our, you know, we're pioneers here, Russell Taylor is here and many others, I'm sure. Um, then fast forward in our region, the trans frontier conservation area and uh, the whole concept of mega parks for meta populations. And more recently, there is a, a clear recognition that if we try to do fortress conservation without recognizing the interaction for development, so key landscapes for develop, conservation and development, that's some of the discourse, that's the paradigm shift, that's how we are moving. Why is it important for us to deal with this now and from IFO, following and working together with other players in the conservation community and development fraternity, and in fact governments, we realize that the magnitude of the threats are growing. They are going to continue to be resource conflicts at local, regional, and international levels. And of course, climate is a reality. And there are some maybe climate scientists here. I'm not, not one of those. Um, and the what does it mean for shifts of where wildlife goes, of the quality of habitats, of the quest for water? For, for browse, the quest for productive you know, agricultural land uh, for people, where do we put? So these are, are real issues. And then why elephants? Clearly we know people use basic terms like they are the gardeners of the ecosystems. Um, they open up, they help to, to, to pollinate, they help to spread seeds, they help to, to cultivate. And of course the lesser ones follow and, um, and they move. And it's a pride of Africa in Southern Africa, and not that this is an audience from Southern Africa, but there's no doubt that we do host the significant population globally. And we need to talk about that. So as an, as an institution, we have decided and chosen to use it as a flagship species. Some could call it keystone species, but I'm aware that even the elephant scientists do consider it as such. And you can talk of the, the wells in the oceans. So this is kind of the, the real kind of um, background. So nothing new under the sun, but we need to push the envelope. And for us, we have simply decided to say, we want to be part of the discourse to promote connectivity, to allow the megafauna space to move and to exist and persist over time. The problem, I kind of alluded to it already, but I think it's always a good reminder that historically we had, um, uh, I'm not sure whether this is on presentation. Okay, good, let me put it on. Pre is it on presentation now? Um, the elephant range used to be much larger, but right now we only see them in a paltry 14% of the original land. And we have seen our populations go down to just under half a million from what used to be millions, not even so far back in the 70s. That's a problem. And what we now have are what I would call broken plates of isolated, designated, categorized national parks and conservancies and forest reserves. And then in the buffer zone, we have community lands or other systems that are able to actually contain and have wildlife. And we know that's where the genesis of things like campfire, the wildlife management areas in Tanzania, the game management areas in Zambia, and so forth and forth, group ranches in Kenya, et cetera. So wildlife needs more space and it needs to wander, but because we have really manipulated and continue to do so rightfully, so within the designated protected areas, uh, the dynamics of the populations are also changing in response to that, whether it's water provision, which we need to do. Um, and, and then when we don't do stuff in the buffer zones, conflicts arise. And we know human wildlife conflict is one of the 
more serious issues. And we say, how do we create a sense of willingness to coexist? Because we know that indigenous people, local communities are proud of wildlife because that's part of their identity, our totems, name them. But if my crops get damaged, if our lives are, are actually, people lose lives or people are injured, that's a problem. Then the question is who benefits from having this wildlife resource, this pride of ours. So the quest for negotiating safe passages that I will talk about moving forward and reference to what IFO's vision and plan across the elephant range countries in Southern and East Africa is essentially to have um, an arrangement that various landowners, interest groups, significant governments, local communities, private sector, NGOs, and all of us can work together to carve out space that will allow elephants to move as far as they can, as they will have to do any, they're already doing because they need to get more water. And with climate change, some areas are getting drier, some are getting wetter. So they will go for that because that's the only way to save the species. Um, why is this not moving? I seem not to be able to move my screen for some reason. Okay. It, uh, uh, can you see the slide on poaching and illegal wildlife, MX? Just to be sure I'm not talking to myself. No, not at the moment. Um, so it's just stuck on the introductory slide. Oh no, that's not, that's not nice. Okay. So we are on this one. Um, so it's now, the presentation is no longer there. Okay, let me put it back, sorry. Sorry guys for that. Um, but what I said still remains relevant, okay. so don't mind. Are you able to see it now, the, the first slide? First slide, yes. There we go. So so I talked about all this, so you know, I'm sure it's still in the head. So you have the record there. Then I'd gone now to the problem and I was talking, sorry. So the elephant range, historical, that's how big it was, current range. And those are the parks, the broken place. Um, and these are the problems. Again, not new to us, poaching, illegal wildlife trafficking, um, human wildlife conflict, fragmented habitats, climate change. These are huge and their magnitude has increased. And that's why it is timely for us now to continue working and do something differently, bold action and fresh thinking because it transcends the entire range area for elephants and other wildlife is also persecuted because of that. Now. There is, this is our idea of connectivity again from years back is driven by science. Once we have a call, you have a buffer sinks, elephants will go there. We know that wildlife spends, 60% of wildlife and elephants spend outside designated parks. So we cannot just confine our efforts for into the parks and not take care of the buffer zones, the campfire areas, community lands, conservancies, etc. And as I for, we have continued now to do analysis of where the elephants are, their distribution, what elements mapping the structural connectivity that exists, building on work that was started years back, looking at some of the genetic data of the subpopulation, and then look at what are the meta populations, where can they go? Looking at the land use land cover layers, how are they changing? Looking at the human development footprint in terms of the agendas for development that are underway. How can we, overlay that and identify those parcels of land that are still functional, that are still usable, that we need to get ahead of the game and negotiate for their being secured for elephants to use. And ultimately the goal would be to then have stable persistent populations of elephants. And once we do that, other species also benefit and we are all proud of our responsibility. Now, The geographical area of what we are calling kind of creating room to roam, this is a term just for simplicity, is IFO already works in Northwestern Zimbabwe in the Wangi area here. And there we have a program around working with Zimpax 
and other. Some of you here on the ground, and we have a, a unique program of rescuing individual animals, rehabilitating them, and then reintroducing them to the world with Forestry Commission. And then in the center here, so this kind of represents the Kaza part of Zimbabwe within the Kaza cluster of elephants. Then you go into the central Malawi Kasungu National Park, into Lukusuzi and Luambe, which is in Eastern Zambia, again, connecting to the Luanga cluster of, 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 um, of elephants. And then we move into the Tanzania connection. This is it's a significant elephant range country. And that's where you have the Selu Game Reserve, other national parks, Nyerere National Park. And then further up here, we have the Greater Kilimanjaro landscape, Southern Kenya, Northern Tanzania. So the three kind of blue purple are what we call IFO anchor landscapes. And the vision for Room to Room in a nutshell, which I'll continue to talk and reflect a few maps here is, how do we work together with many of you here, if not preferably all of you, to identify those seg segments in the yellow kind of coded, that's that schematic area where these clusters can be closer to each other. And part of the reason is we know that climate change models are pointing to areas getting drier and others getting wetter and elephants need to move. And if we don't get ahead of the game, we are likely to then lose those species if they are converted to other uses that won't allow it to save as uh, good elephant habitats. So that's essentially the, the, whole, the whole issue. Now, for this to happen, it obviously requires a lot of um, collaboration. We are excited because a lot of what we are want to build in, into the contribution here is aligns with significant policy you know, issues around the globe and continentally and nationally. We have the sustainable development goals. That agenda is premised on the natural resources in to a large extent and community well-being. And that well-being can only happen if the coexistence with wildlife is well fostered. The African Union Agenda 2063 is very clear language on why wildlife matters for Africa and elephants are obviously a source of pride. CBD, the post-2020 frameworks, the provisions for that, PAs and other effectively managed areas. The 30 by 30 campaign for nature initiative, CMS, uh, SADC, you know, East African Community Environmental Governance Frameworks. They are very clear on the wildlife pieces, the aspirations for that, and overall the whole idea of climate change. We know it's all premised on what is the role of habitats that are safe for wildlife in carbon sequestration. So the issue of connectivity is already catered for and provided for within various policy you know, frameworks well, that start from local government all the way through to the international global st stage. And what IFO is looking to do with partners is to say, let's do some and make a difference. Let's do something to operationalize these provisions. Now, I will now zero into what we are doing uh, and very in a pretty quick way so that we can spend more time discussing. IFO has literally when you formalize this, um, uh, this, this initiative, been working in Kenya in 2019, looking at establishing a first all female ranger team in Amboseli, um, looking at um, enterprises that are small for local women groups, which is quite unheard of in Maasai land and culture, uh, looking at supporting scholarships you know, for young kids that live in the buffer zones in the group ranches, and we formalized our relations with the government of Zimbabwe again the same year through an MOU to, to work together in, in Wanke and in particular in the southern part in Makona area sector of, of uh, the, the, the main camp sector. And then in 2020, we, COVID set in as we know, and then we all kind of slowed down but continued to work with Zim parks in, Zim, in, in Zimbabwe at least to around scooping some of the parks for water provision. And then in Kenya, in Kitende and Conservancy, you, you, uh, we can show you the maps later on, supporting range of you know, infrastructure, their patrols at a time when all wildlife authorities, in fact, were not able to do that. And then in Zimbabwe, we have continued and continue to do so now to really provide infrastructure. Now, the, these are anecdotal examples I'm picking of over the last two years, essentially the period when COVID was at its peak and still is in some ways, 
but we continue to work this because the building blocks of successful connectivity is around how the anchor landscapes where we work are resilient, are secured, and then elephants can move out and build populations that then can move out to other areas. Now, we continue to do that into the next year, and um, we are looking at increasing more community engagement. Uh, we have undertaken um, needs assessment and benefited from some of the work done as part of the CASA to inform what we can do with communities around Wangi. And a key next step for us is solidly being on the ground in that Tanzania sector. We have started conversations with the government of Tanzania. Uh, they're at an advanced stage and we're looking forward to being present on the ground, working with other players and other NGOs in, in Tanzania. And once that happens, it essentially allows us to, to connect the, that whole Luangwa sector piece in the Malawi-Zambia landscape into Mozambique in Nyasa and then the Nyasa to, you know, in your area link and then all the way to the north until we get to greater Kilimanjaro area. So this again is very quick overview speaking from what IFO has done. And when I say what IFO has done, it's never IFO on its own, it is IFO with other players. Our government hosts in all these countries are the core partners. Our delivery model is to capacitate the rangers the scientists, the ecologists, the veterinary you know, doctors that are in these places to be able to be well resourced and carry out the duties for which they're you know, adequately trained and have the competencies. Then we provide you know, very nominal core technical expertise. So in all these countries, we, we have individuals that are on the ground and liaise and work to provide some of the best practice that could come to bear once they are customized for context from the breadth of our global programs world over. So in Zimbabwe, you know, Philip Kowalga is there, Nelson Mutlanga is there, and we will probably get a few more people in due course. So that's our delivery model. Now, I talked about Tanzania, and just to, 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 to be clear there, we, and this again are all schematic, just to be sure, when you see Nyerere Nyasa Wildlife Corridor, it has been identified as a functional connection Tanzania has got a corridors strategy, and it's one of these. And that area they passes through wildlife management areas. So we have been on the ground to Nyerere National Park, that part which was designated you know, a few years back as a park from being a, a, a reserve. And the intent formally concluded is to work in the southern sector of that park, uh, that Likuyu, Kalulu, Ilonga. And then we look at the conversations and engagement with players in Nyasa National Reserves, you know, some of the players we know. So again, it's not an IFO initiative alone. So that's the, the kind of Tanzania connection. The big thing with this kind of ambitious initiative is, where is the money? Um, do we have enough resources to deliver uh, for elephants and for people and for Africa um, with the, well-intentioned, you know, individual philanthropy, uh, government grants, we don't think so. Clearly, there is significant funding gap, and it has been analyzed over the years. So IFO is looking at really cutting big time um, impact investments that align with the, our conservation aspirations. These are corporates, private individuals that will come and invest in value chains partnering with governments and local communities in the places we work and push for value chains that will allow food systems, in some cases, tourism or whatever green you know, technology to be done in a way that is compatible to enhance you know, healthy ecosystems and secure spaces for, for, for elephants. So positioning issues around the Green Climate Fund looking at how we can push the envelope on PES and then what scope is there for debt for nature swaps. It might not apply for Zimbabwe, it might not apply for some countries, but we know it's in the kitty. So the message is we need to put everything on the deck and again, bold action and fresh thinking to the funding of conservation in order to be able to secure spaces for elephants and, um, and, and people to thrive together. 
Now, zeroing in on where we work now, you would see we, we are currently working really in the group with Namboseli National Park in Kenya, Namboseli National Park, which is a very tiny park, uh, but around it is the Ogululuri group ranch there. And we have secured to date and continue to the Kitenden Conservancy here, just next to the border with Tanzania. That's a critical corridor because elephants on a daily basis move between Amboseli National Park into Kilimanjaro National Park, into the wildlife management area here. And if we let this piece of land that are owned by local communities get converted to production of avocado, for argument's sake, or any other value chain, we have choked and they become confined here. And we know what that means in terms of justifiability, genetics, et cetera. And then conflict, of course, will arise because elephants will keep on coming to that farm. And the idea of fencing the space for them, but we, we try to, our view is use them on, on a need basis than is the, the, the kind of default. Um, there are a few yellow areas there, Elaingarunyoni, Olnereka, these are all areas that the group branch, which is community land really, if in their own master plan, which you contributed to us, said we want this to be space for elephants, we want this to be space for a conservancy, and we work with them now to say, once we have secured that, how do we start now tapping into private sector investors that can start taking over the cost of running the ranger operations, the cost of what the pastoralists they need to do. And that's the modus operandi. This is the East Africa side. But let me also then now move into the greater ATK. And what this includes is, you look at the Serengeti there in Tanzania, you look at um, all the way to the Mara. We are not there, but we consider them to be critical priority habitats. So the players that work there, whether it's WWF, whether it's a Frank Zoological Society, we talk to them. So again, the connectivity initiative, the room to room initiative, we are basically bringing our own contribution through the anchor landscapes where we work, but saying, how do we con combine these clusters to link them and not by physically being present in Serengeti, in Mara, but working and having a dialogue with our peers that are out there. So that's the modus operandi, but we are going to be moving already into the, the Tsavo complex. So our work is expanding there now, working with other partners and local communities. Then you, you come down to um, the Tanzania angle. I, I, I talked about it earlier, but the key thing there for me is just so you know, we are out here in, in, in the north and then we pass through Makame, these are all WMAs. That, that kind of line there is just indicative of pathways that are possible for elephants to end up in Selu Game Reserve, Nyerere National Park, and then further down there. Again, get me right, this is not to the dot in terms of grid reference, but a schematic reflection of the movements that will happen, that can happen. And key is, as part of food security, the African Development Bank, Africa is moving towards getting all these economic growth corridors, um, the agricultural corridors, SAGOT, etc. We need to negotiate where the, the production should happen and how they should carve out areas for elephants to move in the wildlife. Because if once the area is cleared, we, we know it's, it's, it's gone, that's it. So preempting that, being able to talk to to the investment centers, to the ministers of agriculture, ministers of lands, the community traditional leaders, uh, talking to the minister of finance and economic development, the non-traditional partners, in addition to our environment line ministries. So that's the way to do it because that's eventually how we can win the battle. And then the, the, the middle Luangwa cluster area, we are already present in, in that Lukusuzi area. But looking at, you know, in, when you get to Lower Zambes, there, there are significant players that are doing fantastic work, the same in the Luangwa area. But we have all these game management areas here, Chisomo, Luano there, Rufunza, there are players there. How do we make sure that if we look at this middle Zambes, Lower Zambes cluster, Manapus here, if elephants want to go through here, are they going to be able to do that? Again, it's not like a highway, but if we're able to secure pieces of land that can be habitable, they contribute directly or indirectly to the security of ele elephants and um, 
again, healthy ecosystems. Um, so that's the, 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 the plan. Now, last but not least is, uh, uh, it is my home country and mo for most of you here, but others too, um, the Kaza it's a big one. I mean, we, we know it's um, of global significance because it was the largest elephant population. It is five countries that in itself is complex because it also comes with multiplicity of um, communities to be involved. It's a huge tourism hub and all those things are pressures that can really push and give a challenge to um, to, to how we are able to manage elephants. We have seen and witnessed uh, unexplained elephant deaths. We have seen the use of fences in some parts, um, but the good thing is because of the regional economic community, SADAC, there is a unity in a decision to manage the elephant populations as one and to, to collaborate, to do joint censuses. And uh, that cluster of our anchor landscapes as IFO is very significant. But what you recognize is that, you know, you look at Wange, then you have in the outside the, the safari areas and then outside the community areas, then the commercial farms. And you go into the Sebungwe area, there are some parks that would do with the restoration in terms of numbers and even habitat quality. Um, there is a multiplicity of players, which is good for, for the region. We need to coordinate better. We need to work together in terms of making sure this agenda can go forward. So what you see in the right bottom corner there is a schematic indications elephants are moving. It's not like these are the highways cordoned for elephants, but just saying they spread over anywhere. And when they do that, they go beyond Wanke National Park. They get into the Matetsis, they get into Botswana, into other places. So our connectivity initiative, our room to Rome agenda is to say, let's get together. And for IFO, we are going to, to concentrate in investing in the anchor landscapes, the Wange sector in Northwestern Zimbabwe, um, the Luangwa sector looking at the Eastern side of some of the parks in Zambia, Lukusuz and Luambe that need a lot of work to be done. Kasungu in Malawi, which literally lost over a thousand elephants to a poultry 2050. But since we started working there, there are now about 150 elephants. Uh, and we will be actually planning to move elephants there soon. Um, and then working with other partners in, in, in Tanzania, we will have also some on the ground work in uh, the newest park in that country. And then we continue to expand our work in the greater Kilimanjaro, Amboseli Kilimanjaro area. So that's room to roam in a nutshell. Now, the last slide, this I picked on um, elements of players that bring it, bet it all together. So they are the national multilateral and bilateral institutions there. The logos can speak for themselves. The sample NGOs I put there are just samples. It's not to be exclusive, but the message there is for room to roam, for connectivity to be successful, as far as IFO is concerned, it's not a one NGO mission. It's not a one government mission. It's not a one community mission. It's not a one development bank mission. It's all hands on deck. It's partnerships. It's regional economic communities. It's economic growth agendas being married into the need to secure the very drivers of that agenda. And it is the natural resource capital and elephants. We are using them as flagships. So we will be coming to you. Some of you, we have already talked and we will continue to dialogue, to learn from what you are doing, to see where we can connect those, um, um, those elements to what we are doing, and also to hopefully do cross-learning really um, and information sharing to exchange. But that's um, the whole idea of uh, what IFO is pushing. It's a significant institutional project and I'll end by just saying um, we are doing similar work uh, in India, um, in the Great Manas you know, area with the Wildlife Trust of India. Uh, we are doing work in Southern Kenya where we have the only 300 elephants 
plus or minus in southern Kenya, in Yunnan province. Um, and um, we also are working for different species, uh, but with the Great Eastern Ranges initiative in Australia. So it's, it's, we are focused on African savanna elephants, but the models, we are rolling them out in other geographies as part of our global programs. And in the oceans, we're looking at the North Atlantic right well, again, where they are moving in various graphs, the gray worlds, et cetera. Same principles, same ideas. And part of the reasons is because climate change is changing the resource dynamics, uh, the physiology of the, 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 the wildlife, the interactions, the stuff that we kind of know from basic biology. What does that mean? How can we get ahead of it? And on that note, I want to say again, let's work together and let's get to work. And uh, thank you for the time and uh, sorry for the initial disconnect on the slides, but I'll end there now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jimmy, for that uh, insightful, exciting and stimulating uh, uh, talk. And uh, I can see that there is already a couple of questions that have been put on the chat. And uh, Greg is uh, probably two, two of those. And Greg, if you might in a moment, just get yourself off mute. In the meantime, one, one question for me, it's, it's always amazing when people talk about um, Kaza and, and I, I I'll ask this to you, and you know, I know there might be people who have opinions about that. Um, why we never really uh, go further up to Angola, because as far as I see, there is actually quite scope to go up to Angola coming down, because you know, I think studies by um, a number of people, including. Uh, colleagues at University of Pretoria have projected and modeled that there could be potential movement up right up to, to Angola. Um, so that's one question uh, for you, Jimiel. And then um, Greg, if you might, uh, please do, do ask your two questions. Should I wait for Greg uh, to go? Faisa, go ahead, Greg. <laughs> Okay, well, my what I what I what I typed in the box. Um, I'm I'm fascinated about my first question was uh, more about this debt for nature swaps. I think this is such a, a positive move, and I just wondered, you know, if it's something that's been a, bra a brainstorm of an idea or something that's actually moving forward. Because often, as we all know, that uh, countries national debts create poverty and poverty creates climate, you know, habitat destruction and the will to want elephants, for example, or other wildlife. And can you, have you got any more information on that to share with, with us? Because I'd love to know there is, how, where it's progressed regress to. Thanks, Greg. Uh, I have to say, I'm not an expert on that. I, I use this, but so in, in general, and I'll, I'll dig out, I've got a team that has actually written some briefs on that, which I can, I'll be happy to share with you and even maybe others here at MX. Um, it, I think the principle is, to your point, um, it's, it has to depend on the willingness of the, the government to, to commit that if um, some of the debt relief is done, they will then invest whatever savings they would have secured from having to pay the debt towards securing resources, nature, in this case, conservation. So one would hope in the case of Zimbabwe and that is applicable differently. Um, if Zimpax is struggling for money, which we know they are, um, um, not for mm -hmm. their own making, but uh, um, if, if there was an agreement that the government of Zimbabwe sees their natural heritage and elephants in this case, which I think we do as a country, is key enough, we would negotiate and commit and meet the commitment and stay in line by saying whatever budget we would have used to save the IMF debt, I'm just picking examples here, uh, would then be flowed into equipping Zimpax and other players to secure those. Other. Now that level of way it is going, I think it has worked very well in other countries like in Latin America, et cetera, and in, in Southeast Asia, uh, I don't know how, in African countries, I have no examples, but I can pick a few of those and just so that's the principle in any way. That's that's which I think you already knew, but that's that's to me is the way we should look at it. Can we have more players? If Africa says 
elephant range can say no we really think elephants are key or we really think wildlife is key for our african you know, in the agenda for economic growth why not do it but yeah. i think that's where again the issue that you know are, are we dialoguing enough with the minister of finance minister of economic development with investment centers i personally know others can i would love to hear others we, we haven't really done enough homework to bring those parties to say there's nothing anti-development against development when we say secure parks when you say don't mine here when you say don't do it here you can mine somewhere else but still have it both you can put a dam somewhere else you still have it both i think at times we hear about ah, a road is coming here now it's too late it's already crossing the park you remember the issue of um you know in in serengeti which was rescinded earlier when people made a bit of noise minings in different parks they come and go we don't have to be putting placards and you know fighting against that we should just be on the planning table from the beginning i kind of diverted there yeah thanks Greg. Mm -hmm. um the other one on angola mx i I've, I've seen some people here that are excellent gurus on that but all i would say is i think with um there is very positive movement i mean there's a whole uh, you know delta act it is in the u.s context that was put together to to move resources through various u.s agencies uh, but i'm sure also the eu and the, there are i think players the wwf is somewhere there ci um and the w and, and the, the nature conservancy um they are coming into the ground to work with the restoration of you know a couple of parks there and so that potential is there i think and the space we need is to me these are some of the additional range we should secure so that you know as one becomes more desert i'm not wishing for that but elephants will be able to find somewhere to go yeah but russell and others can also chime in because it's supposed to be a discussion but i just wanted to <laughs> that, that, yeah 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 uh, Russell, did you want to add anything to to the uh, question on um, Angola? Uh, um, uh, thanks, MX. I'm actually busy writing a question, but uh, I'll try and answer that. <coughs> I, th I think we need to recognize that, first of all, Casa TSA is, if you look at its boundaries, is essentially a political construct. It's not necessarily uh, an ecosystem on its own as such. So it's been put together by the five countries. And as a result, it may not be conserving all that you want to conserve. And for example, in Angola, uh, what is key to the survival of the Kavango Zambezi system flowing into the Delta Okavango swamps is actually the headwaters of Angola, three rivers in particular. Um, and they are not within the cars of TFCA and plans for their development don't really align with what we might like to see happening so far as conservation downstream goes. So we've got to try and manage these things and try and align our thinking so that we can achieve compatible uh, non-conflictual uh, arrangements between how we use these headwaters and how we end up managing downstream the larger Casa landscape, which, as I say, is largely a, a political landscape anyway. I know that helps. That's really, really useful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it touches on what, Jimmy, you are talking about, the fact that, you know, it's it's trying to connect land, but as well, there is a connection, I think, at um, political levels um, that needs to happen and connecting uh, between us as conservationists and other, other entities that are not traditionally uh, conservation players. Which leads me to a question from Alston um, Alston asks, what's the level of involvement on non-conservation players in this conservation strategy? Somehow, while conservation partners look at the restoration, uh, maintenance of these corridors routes with optimism, the other sectors are planning developments that chalk these routes, creating islands. That's a, a great question, Aniston. Um, <laughs> Did I say 
Alison, you know, we, we, we are our own enemies as a community because we do talk to others. So there's so, so much uh, inside thinking which without bouncing ideas. So this initiative is looking at uh, embracing the humanitarian and development players. Um, the the Africans, the World Visions, the Plan Internationals, the various health you know initiatives, water provisions that sink bores in in catchments and they end up drying. And then you say why? Because the forest, the catchments and forests are not being protected. Um, these are sectors because they tend to look at humanitarian and social goods. They are if lots of money, you know, relatively of course, but often more than what we get. How can we tap into that by simply coordinating and um, complementing each other? It doesn't have to come to us, but if our plans are participatory and we know what they want to do and how they want to, 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 to promote climate smart agriculture, we, we then in the zonation and micro zoning work on that and they put money there and we focus on our key competencies. So all to say, IFO is looking at getting that. We have started doing that. We have a whole list of um, partners that we need to get, and starting with where we work. Uh, some of the needs assessment say in Wanke, looked at who is doing what where, um, and uh, we do the same in Malawi, Zambia. And in fact, a, a good number of the institutional donors, whether you talk of the EUs and the US government, you know, donors in the UK, they will tell us, are you talking to the other development agents we are funding in the same landscapes? And I think that term I put in the first slide, I will close to that about the key landscapes for conservation development was emphasized significantly in the, by the EU team in the current strategic cycle where they said, no, I am in development is key. Yeah. So great question on that, um, 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 Alistair, I appreciate. And so it needs that. And my, when I say hands on deck, all hands on deck is basically everybody, not Let's talk to the non-traditional partners. We are all in one here. Otherwise, it's, it, we kind of fight and seem to be undoing each other. Yeah. Um, th th then I think the issue of of um, I see something around. Oh, no, you go, you go ahead and read the question because I think you. Were yeah, yeah, that. yeah. So the next question, Jimmy, I'll say is, is from uh, uh, Marilyn, who is asking. I'd like to hear Jimmy's thoughts on Zimbabwe's triple bottom line, and if we can achieve sustainability. I am presuming this is, you know, people's livelihoods. Uh, yeah. Ecology. Social, economic, and that. Yeah, yeah, and and all those. Yeah. I mean, that's a loaded question, but I can comment as, an, as a Zimbabwean too. I mean, uh, so a couple of things. I, if I'm an optimist, just so I, I can put it out there, <laughs> those that know me, I don't give up. I think Zimbabwe is really at a juncture where with the talent we have in country and abroad, we can bring that brain trust to bear on the connections of the social needs and um, an economic development pathway, you know, aligned with the current visions that the government has put in place. I mean, there is a vision, there are plans, and um, nothing is ever perfect in life anywhere you go. So there is a vision, which is good. Um, they've identified growth points like around Victoria Falls, stock exchange, etc. That's where Wanke is, that's where Kaza is, that's where tourism is. Why shouldn't we take advantage of that? Um, then we have communities that have always lived with wildlife from years back. We Remember in the early days of Kaza, I mean, I don't know how active it is now, the whole Zazibona or Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, traditional leaders had platforms to exchange and to talk about their wishes and their desires. Um, so it can be done. I think we just need to crack the, the piece around dialogue on the people that make decisions financial decisions, investment decisions, and uh, appreciation of the non-monetary value, but which eventually drives monetary value if, of, of nature. And, and I think that we have enough, I think brain trust to do that in Zimbabwe. Honestly, I, 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 there are a lot of brilliant people and then there is a lot of, I think there's atmosphere, the open for business alone is a good mantra. Uh, 
but it's up upon us as it's upon Zimbabwe to translate that into a reality. If we say open business, are we going to practice those you know elements that allow for communities to benefit so that there's no there's no conflict uh, or thinking that it's only the left hand getting the most because they are private sector uh, and then um, we are, our crops are being damaged and likewise a pride as a nation. So I'm very optimistic. Um, it's I think that future is in all our hands. Honestly, um, we are the. <laughs> We are the constituencies. We 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 contribute to the discussions. Yeah, I mean, I, it's not a straight answer, but I, I, I'm op optimistic. Let me say that. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, there is an interesting question, Jimmy. I'll hear from Russell, which uh, you know, it would be good to hear what you think um, as well on it. And it reads, biophysical and socioeconomic connectivity, biodiversity, um, conservation, climate change, mitigation, and adaptation underpin human elephant coexistence. What do you consider to be the greatest challenge uh, to this coexistence? Yeah. Uh, if if, if uh, I, for in your thinking, you you've grappled with this and what, what, what do you think? Yeah, it's a great question, Russell. And um, my, my sense from even just reflecting on where we have come from and is we have probably not done enough to embrace the, and empower the voice of um, indigenous people in local communities and traditional leadership. We, we, it's very clear there that we, we started from fortress conservation, you know, which was well intentioned. You know, we put some places with funds we identified, categorized, but the bulk of the range is in where these very voices are. And what is the case with those voices? They are largely poor, but they are victims. In this case, they appear to be victims to the the, the resources that are taken care of, taken care of and actually chewing the money through management. Um, and then who benefits a private sector investor comes in, nothing wrong with that. So the benefit sharing, even answering the question, which I know as years back in the early days of campfire, whose elephants are they? Are they for the government? Are they for the community? Are they for the tourism operator who gets money? And that's it. If we, if we strike that balance well, I think a lot of the movement around, you know, PPPs and uh, you know, private community partnerships and public partnerships are in the right direction. We need to is I think non-business interested parties, that's which is I for is and many other NGOs, be the brokers of those partnerships to make sure that there's no short changing of community land is valuable. Land is the most precious piece, but some of the concessions and negotiations are not really quite economically you know, reflective of the value of that land. And I think we need to do that. So I think if communities are, are happy, that's key. If governments realize that political angle, which you talked about earlier on, I think those two pieces will make it so different because we know that if there's no water because climate change is going to do that, the very well that the communities dig up with their money is where the one elephant goes and simply empties it, boom. They're going to kill it. Um, so where they go and graze alliance came. So these to me are the challenges of um, coexistence. And if we can really provide tangible benefits and communities and I mean, as a villager myself, well, I guess that's an identity from you know, a few years back because I've been stuck in these brick and walls. Um, you know that you are proud of your forest. You are proud of saying we live with wildlife when you grow up and, and that's that's key. So what IFO is doing, we, 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 started getting community leaders around from the place where we work to talk to each other. So in the group branches in Kenya, there is a group branch leadership that is traditional there. Then in Malawi, there are senior chiefs there and the same would apply in Wangi outside in the Chorosho area there. We want them to dialogue among each other and share their challenges as they do this stuff. And that's building a, a, a coalition, not to fight anybody, but of 
lesson learning and sharing, and that strengthens their voice. And we can work with them to strengthen their parts. Again, the same vision for campfire for life in conservancies in Namibia, anywhere else, but do it better, not kind of this um, paltry superficial benefits. That's kind of my sense, Russell. Um, I think then we can do it. Then the rest of biophysical things become easy. Uh, let's take advantage of the regional economic communities. The protocols for SADC are solid. They talk of nice, nice cities are there. Why are we not doing that? Um, sovereign states are willing to open up where there is a win-win, but I guess win-win is again also theoretical, but where there's some balance of sharing, yeah, yeah. Excellent, good question. Um, a similar question is, what's your take on social ecological resilience in highly connected uh, systems? Um, uh, so that, that's one question. Let me just um, uh, read also another question, Gmail, so that mm -hmm. you can answer this uh, uh, to, uh, at once. Uh, Paul says, thank you for your interesting presentation. Uh, firstly, to what extent can international commitment to biodiversity planetary boundary work be aligned with elephant corridor creation in Africa? And secondly, do you believe this could open a different source of funding? I'll start with that one because I think it's, it's, it's I mean, the other one is, is kind of, yeah, because last, I like that. On that one, I would say it's, it, it is already aligned. Uh, I mean, one is just to think about the, the, they have been initiated by the traditional donors uh, of USID, EU around, you know, most of the issues I talked about, transboundary natural resource management areas, TFCAs, they are funded by the very international big donors, at least from a government uh, that believe in securing this. I think there is more and more appetite now because of the clear threat or challenge of migration. The reason why we, we keep on drowning, trying to cross the various water bodies to go to where we think things are greener is because we're running away from the place. So the, the worst, the international platforms, because that's where the money comes from, feel that if we can build the resilience and capacity to, to, to retain where we live, uh, because we're proud of where we, we belong, there's no reason for me to try and cross and risk being eaten by a crocodile or by sinking in some boat, you know, somewhere there. So I think that willingness is there. And some of the area issues I just put in bullets around the policy platforms, whether it is you know, the conventional, you know, migratory species, whether it is the conventional biological diversity, whether it is um, a, a few other things. The, even the UNFCCC, the climate convention is talking about putting money for to mitigate climate change, to adapt to climate change. So once you do that, then people stay there. So I think that willingness is there. Um, that, that I think what I've heard and continue to hear, especially around private sector is, they're not able to find bankable opportunities because there are so many risks, whether it is political risk, whether it is assurances, you know, et cetera. So in some ways, you know, as Africa, we should, do better, and I think it links to the question about that tip of bottom is their future. I think we need to build that confidence to the would be partners that can put money into what we do. Yeah, um, so that's the first part. It's not for adequate, but that's kind of my reflections on that. Uh, then the issue for from Bekezela, social ecological resilience in highly connected systems. If I read it well, but you know, from the base of, uh, that is we are basically saying how do we balance those two in 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 systems now. To me, the social values, the social benefits and goods and services are usually anchored around the ecology and the natural so the systems that are functioning and driving that. So if I am simply able to demonstrate that the, the offtake of benefits accruing from that ecological resource, don't jump from the immediate people there who have to coexist with it, then that resilience to me can be built easily. Because it means that is, 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 is the, the social construct of what happens in these systems 
would be working towards making sure that they remain resilient to, to sustain and to maintain their quality of life or the quality of safety provision. And I think at times we don't see that. It's almost like we, we go back to the, the, the tragedy of the commons in some ways because they realize, okay, I'm trying to do good, but actually somebody comes in, sets up a contract through some office in Narare, just using that as an example. The next thing they've got a permit to do something. And was, meanwhile, I was just trying to, to make a living respecting that resilience by making sure the trees are there, making sure that the, the soil is well tilled, et cetera. So that's the way I see it. Um, and that's, that's how you can make sure that that happens. Um, and we also have to be, some things are not just connected. Some things have already been lost. And I think to me, to ask room to roam is, uh, how do we secure those that are not, have not been lost? Or how do we restore those that are restorable? Um, that's, that's kind of my, my take. It's a, it's a big topic though that you, you said. And uh, I, I can also check with some of my social scientists because, I've got somebody who is working on, uh, just so you know, a colleague who is working on um, on the value of uh, natural capital for for human well-being and happiness. And um, that's a loaded thing. And they're looking at some certification process that can be done using landscape work. So I, I, I will be happy to bounce through the chapter, MX, uh, some things that can be fed back to the, the followership here. Mm. Thank you, Chimio. I think um, it's been an interesting, um, conversation so far. I wanted to give Panache, it's slightly um, a left field question, but I think uh, this shows the importance of having people like yourself coming through. Um, Panache wants to ask a question as a young conservationist. Uh, um, Panache, if you can, please do get uh, to switch on your microphone and uh, ask Jimmy up. Okay, thank you, Amex. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. It was really something worth the afternoon, eh? My question is that there are a lot of young, fragmented professionals who add value into the whole conservation picture. In Zimbabwe, I would say there are a lot of veterinarians of which I'm part of one, but they are not part of the system helping out the bigger picture, maybe to contribute significantly to room to roam. These people will be dotted around your corridor. Then they come along some other scientists or other ecologists. How can they be part of these bigger pictures? Half of the time, young professionals are fragmented out to the point that when they come in, it's almost like an afterthought. They may That's have a chance to start careers that build around that, not being dependent on that, but just be around this other bigger picture. For me, for example, I live close to Siakobu, just outside Kariba, and it's a day-to-day -day conflict with elephants. You start getting to appreciate why communities do certain things in a way, but then you have what you think might help them long term and still create this corridor we talk about. Wow, this is refreshing. Thanks, Panache. Um, and you are spot on. Um, youth, I'll, I'll, I'll categorize everybody who's a young professional as youth. <laughs> um, are key to how this can evolve and be su successful. And back in 2016, I4, we hosted a youth forum for wildlife that has continued to live. And there are lots of other global youth networks that we continue to support. And I know that um, in the build up to the African Protected Area Conference, which has now been pushed to July, there was going to be a youth forum before that. So that voice is being recognized as the, to, to almost like you know, embrace the, the youth dividend that Africa has, but we're probably not optimizing that. So that's a good point. Um, I4 is a fan of um, internships and mentorships, and we do that. It is where I sit. There's a whole team that works with the Smithsonian system to get folks that get attached, um, and the same would happen in where we work. Um, the piece of veterinary science, um, if I had you right at the beginning, is key to us because 
the origins of I for some of you are, maybe know is actually animal welfare and rescue is one which we pride ourselves to be doing very well. And uh, we are fortunate in, in, in Southern Africa in particular, but even in most of Africa, to have incredible um, partners on the ground. There's great, you know, Rangers International in, you know, the Elephant Orphanage Project um, in, um, in Zambia. They are our partners. We have uh, World is Life in Zimbabwe. And uh, we have a data animal rescue trust. Uh, we've done a few things. My point there is we, we look at that whole continuum of when an, a young elephant is stuck in mud or is left because his mother maybe disappeared for whatever reason, which I won't get into. We have facilities and prayers that can get it into rehabilitation and over time they can re-enter. And we've had similar issues like that in, uh, in Victoria Falls, Panda Masui, at, into the Wanke area. We are with Zimpax, again, I have to give them kudos because we are only there at their own social sponsorship and partnerships. Um, and the same applies in other countries. Um, we work with their field veterinary team, you know, Dr. Mpondi in, in Wanke, and uh, we are looking you know, very soon um, to capacitating ability to do better their own coloring for research, their own response to snared animals in situ and treating the wounds, which now there are so many players, you know, that to help, you know, Dr. Maradini and others. But I think that is space that we need to do more. And so my whole team, you know, our team in rescue, which is global, is excellent at that. And we do that in the in the oceans and everywhere else. So great point. Uh, we are, I can announce in this one that we're actually op opening um, a center of excellence uh, in North America here with a very generous donation to, to, to train because the demand is particularly veterinarians are needed everywhere, Latin America, Caribbean, you know, all over in you know, New Zealand. They're asking for expertise, some of them for the Marines, but the same for elephants. So be on tune. Then you mentioned Cariba, that's my hometown in terms of where I spend most of my, my life. That frequency of elephants walking down the road from the heights and stopping your cars and all that, zebras breeding there is attest to the, the shrinkage of space. So. I think you have got a, a role to play, Panache and all others. And as I for we have engaged somewhat with the, the Harare chapter of the Global Shapers. This is a group of members in, in, in Zimbabwe, and there's a whole global network. Um, some of the, I think the ambassador to the AU, you know, Chipom Pemba is was is a member of that. It just used to be a creator on that. So you can go heights. She's now in the African Union advising. So those are great things I would have to say, um, Panache. It's open, so reach out to us. Uh, my colleague is incredible, and actually, the draft of all this Philip Kowao guy, you can find him and just reach out to us through the chapter, and we are happy to, to connect you. But you are, are the future. Mm. Mm. Thank you so much, Jimmy. That's a powerful uh, offer to end on, uh, particularly um, because I think uh, Panache's point about including being inclusive. Um, of young people is, is really, 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 really important. And uh, I, I know that many people still feel very young, uh, except uh, maybe a few. Uh, so I think that is extended to all of us that still feel we, we, we are young. Jimmy, I'll thank you so much. Um, we so appreciate your presentation this afternoon and the uh, interaction that we've had. Thank you to everybody that's been able to um, field in questions and participate in this. So much to think about whether it's, you know, funding, new sources of funding, uh, crossing political institutional boundaries. And I liked what you are saying. we need bold action, fresh thinking that goes beyond the fortress conservation that we have been used to for, for many decades. Um, so this has been our first uh, seminar this year, and um, we will continue to have these seminars monthly going forward. And I just wanted to ask all of us at this point, we usually do this, um, but it's important that uh, we do it again. Just if you are able to get your camera on, so we can take a photograph of all of us in January and uh, see many of you 
on camera, it would really be good. So just asking you wherever you are, if you can get on camera so we can get uh, a photo of, um, of, of all of you uh, in the various places, uh, wherever you are around the world. If you're not able, we do, we do, do, do understand and um, so just one moment uh, so we can uh, I will ask uh, my colleague um, yeah one of my colleagues uh, Marilyn if you can get a photo of us that would be brilliant if you can a big smile wave uh, excellent, uh, brilliant. Thank you so much, everybody. I think that's done. Uh, good to see Simon and um, many of you uh, that have been a part of our seminar today. Just before we, we, we go, I just wanted to do a news flash. Uh, to many of you, uh, you might know David coming. Uh, David did our first seminar for us and has been a wonderful supporter of our chapter. And our chapter uh, proposed him for the Edward Laroy uh, Memorial Award uh, for SCBC. And we are delighted that David was um, awarded the uh, Memorial Award at the December meeting. Um, so that's a news flash for to many of you. You might not be aware, but uh, David was uh, awarded that and uh, shows the power that we have even as a chapter. Just uh, some last announcements to all of you. Just a reminder, please, if you may, do um, sign up. Uh, as part of, as a friend or a member of Zim SCB. Uh, and there's a link there. Uh, also, we do uh, have a YouTube channel. If you go onto our website, zimscb.org, um, there is a, a link to our YouTube channel and would like you to share that, uh, not just uh, uh, for yourself, but with everybody else within your networks, and make them aware of what we're doing as SCBIM. We will be in touch through our newsletter, which is why it's important to sign up uh, of our forthcoming seminars, but we are looking forward to having a variety of people, uh, women, youth, uh, talking about conservation in Zimbabwe and globally. And so would like to continue to invite you to join us and join the various activities that we're doing as a chapter, whether it's the, 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 the study, the horizon scan that we are engaged with um, and any other projects that we are doing, I uh, would like you to please be a part of that. If you have ideas that you'd like um, us to do, um, we're really open to that. Please feel free to get in touch with us through the website or through our emails. We will be delighted to hear of ideas from many of you. Once again, I just want to say thank you, Jimiel. This has been brilliant. And I know that there are many um, who haven't uh, expressed that. Uh, and I'm saying this on behalf of many others as well, that this has been a fantastic start to a series and uh, so much food for thought through your talk. And we are very delighted to actually have you join us as an exemplar of um, uh, conservationists from Zimbabwe, uh, one of us who have uh, achieved greatly and are leading uh, one of the key conservation organizations uh, globally. And uh, want to also thank everybody else that has joined us today. Uh, please do uh, spread the word. And we know COVID is still there. Uh, do encourage many of you to keep safe wherever you are. 
and uh, thank you. See you in our next uh, seminar series and uh, talk to many of you on email and other platforms. Jimmy, I'll thank you. Thank you, pleasure. Thank you, everybody. And again, keep the good work going. ACB is in chapter. Cheers for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.